what is black theology? These are terms that have come about. What is, what is black theology? It can be interpreted in a, in a couple ways. Black theology, what is it that, uh, how is it that black people are, what is it that black people are interpreting? Uh, how are black people interpreting God's message toward or for them? All right, Bl black theology. Then we have liberation theology. Liberation theology seeks to interpret God's message regarding how one should liberate oneself from the evils of injustice. Then black liberation theology, and these are all terms that are now in academia. Uh, black liberation theology seeks to interpret the same message as liberation theology with its primary concern focused on those of African descent. This theology has its roots in the United States, so there is a particular interest towards black folk in America. So black liberation theology as an academic enterprise was founded in these, in these United States of America. So this question of uh, black liberation theology, how, how do we interpret what God is saying to black folks in regards to liberation, there is a particular uh, interest as far as black folks in America. So black theology, black theology as a term, as a academic term is not new, but uh, probably came into existence maybe uh, in the 1940s and 50s, maybe 60s. But black theology, this notion of how do black people interpret what God is saying to them and them specifically, black theology has been around ever since black folks have been around, right? So that question has always been around since black folks have been around. Roots of black theology within the paradigm of Christianity, right? Because theology is not necessarily um, specific to Christianity. But this terminology, black theology, and the way it's been used in academia, it has been kind of, for the most part, uh, relegated to Christianity. So roots of black theology within the paradigm of Christianity uh, begins in the Afro-Asian part of the world. Language is very important, so certain terms I don't use. I use the term Afro-Asiatic as opposed to a term like Middle East. Middle East uh, is a political term, has political implications. The terminology Middle East came about as a result for political reasons. But in the Afro-Asiatic part of the world, black theology within the paradigm of Christianity has its roots there. A Christian theology that centers on freedom, justice, and liberation has existed within the African community which encompasses African Americans at least since the time of enslavement in the Western Hemisphere. So there has always been a conversation about what is God's message towards black folks who are dealing with injustice, oppression, and exploitation. That question has been in existence in the Western Hemisphere at least since the time of enslavement. That has been a question that has uh, been asked and that, is a qu that has been a question that has been uh, where th those have sought to answer that question ever since the um, ever since African people of African descent came into the new world. There is this perception even amongst many African Americans all right that Christianity has its roots in Europe, um, during the Civil Rights Movement, one of the more powerful criticisms and critiques of Christianity uh, in the Civil Rights Movement towards black folks was that Christianity was a white man's religion. That used to be a moniker that was said about Christianity, um, especially by those who did not practice Christianity, that Christianity was the white man's religion in the way that it had manipulated uh, in the way that others felt that Christianity had been used to manipulate black folks into a type of passivity. But there are some African roots of Christianity. There is the Ethiopian Orthodox Christian Church, 
There is the Coptic Church of Christianity, and these are very old, organized Christian churches. They all antedate, oh, they antedate all the Christian communions of Europe and America except that of the Church of Rome. But the Orthodox, the, and these are in the Eastern Hemisphere, so the Eastern Orthodox Christian community, right? The Ethiopian Orthodox Christian Church, the Coptic Church of Egypt, they are very old churches. Research has shown that Christianity had spread in the Delta and Upper Egypt before the end of the second century. Africa's introduction to Christianity may have been attributed to those people or groups who were the first converts and initial missionaries of the new faith themselves. So in other words, those first groups of Christian converts, that they're those first groups of people that you read about in the Bible, the ones who are just learning about this man, Jesus Christ, and, and the works that he's done, and they're, they're just a generation away from his life or a couple generations away from his life. Perhaps it was those first converts that brought uh, Christianity into uh, or onto the African continent itself. We know Africa is a large continent, right? Africa is a large continent, and Christianity was more, most likely introduced on the eastern uh, part, uh, eastern part of uh, the African continent. Many of those who are of African descent in America, especially those of us who our ancestors came uh, through the Middle Passage, all right, we were um, kidnapped from the western uh, part of Africa. It is my contention that had there not been any disruption in the, uh, on the African continent or uh, on the level of the transatlantic slave trade, that I believe Christianity would have been spread throughout the African continent, much like uh, other religions, whether it be traditional African religions or Islam, other religions. Uh, Christianity probably would have spread in a similar fashion. Coptic Christianity is unique in the sense that I shared with you. It's very old. Uh, it's a very old, organized Christian church. The Coptic Christian church has its own pope, all right? And it proclaims St. Mark as their first pope. Mark, the author of the gospel, Mark, in the Bible, is who they proclaim as their first pope of that church, of the Coptic Christian church. St. Mark is the first patriarch of the church, and the line of patriarchs has been continuous and unbroken all the way up to their current patriarch, Pope Tuadros II. He's the 118th pope of the Coptic Christian church. So if you were to ask someone who's part of the Coptic Christian church, they are able to explain or they are, they are able to list their popes from 118 all the way down to number one, who they, according to Coptic Christianity, is Mark, the author of the second gospel in the Holy Bible. This is a picture of Pope Tuadros, Tuadros the second. He became Pope in November of 2012, I believe. November of 2012. Just some more African roots of Christianity. Y'all pray for me right here while I try to pronounce this, all right? Saint Athanasius was also a pope within the Coptic Christian Church. Pope of Alexandria, which was also like a nickname or another way to acknowledge the pope of the Coptic Church. Another moniker that was given was Pope of Alexandria. Alexandria. Between 327... In 373 A.D., he was the author of the origi original Nassim, Nassim Creed before it was amended in 381. What the Nassim Creed is, um, it's a statement of faith, a, a statement of faith of what this particular church, what the particular faith believes in. 
and the author of the first Nicene Creed was the Pope of Alexandria out of this Orthodox Christian church before it was amended in 381. Monasticism was born in Egypt. This was, a influential, this was influential in the formation of the Coptic Church, Coptic Church's promotion of submission and humbleness that spiritual leaders had to abide by. So monasticism was born in Egypt. St. Maurice, if you speak English, is, might, might be how you pronounce it. Moritz, St. Moritz, he was drafted from Egypt to serve under the Roman flag. And he taught Christianity to the inhabitants, inhabitants, inhabitants of those in the Swiss Alps. This is a depiction of St. Maurice. You will find him in his depiction all over Europe. This is actually a statue. You probably can't see it real good. It doesn't look good on the, on the blow up. But he's clearly of African descent. The story is that he led about 6,000 soldiers, a legion, and they fought. I wish I knew who they fought against. But they were, upon, they were victorious, and upon their victory, they were supposed to swear their allegiance to Caesar, and they refused. They refused to swear their allegiance to Caesar. They felt it was a violation in their relationship to Jesus Christ. So this is one of the saints of the Christian church. Now, I bring up the history because, again, there was, a, there was a notion and there have been monikers that have referred to Christianity as the white man's religion. Um, and what has been brushed aside in history and in the telling of even Christian and Christianity or Christian history is the African origins of Christianity, the African roots of Christianity. Where we typically, especially here in America, where we typically talk about Christianity in relation to people of African descent in America, we typically start around the time of enslavement. We start around the time where enslaved Africans came over into the Americas, the New World, and Christianity was taught to them by slave masters, slave oppressors, for a myriad of different reasons. One of the reasons, slave oppressors, slave masters would teach Africans, enslaved Africans, uh, they would teach them Christianity because the notion was Christianity would civilize the African barbarian. That Christianity would bring civilization to this group of people. So it was good to teach them in an effort to help them. These are all air quotes. <laughs> help them become civilized. So Slave masters, slave oppressors, they looked at this as almost like part of their missionary work. All right. Christianity would um, civilize the uncivilized African. Another reason why European slave masters, European oppressors would teach Christianity was that there was a belief that Christianity would keep the African docile, would keep the enslaved African passive. So the slave master would emphasize, take out of context certain components, certain texts, certain scriptures of the Bible, 
in an effort to promote docility and passivity amongst the African. What I think is important for us to understand, even when we learn and when we tell that story and when we acknowledge that, yes, Europeans, in the midst of the, the European slave trade of Africans, right? I teach my classes that to call it the African slave trade is also incorrect because it, also, it gives a sense that Africa benefited from it. Right? But it was a European slave trade of Africans, a European trade of enslaved Africans. In the midst of the European trade of enslaved Africans, yes, slave masters, slave oppressors, um, they did perpetuate and share a type of Christianity with these enslaved Africans, majority of them who came from Western Africa, right? Who may not have even been exposed to even the Coptic Christianity or the Ethiopic Christianity that I mentioned earlier. However, we should understand this, that enslaved Africans could have never, they could have never accepted Christianity on the same terms that Europeans presented it to them. They could never do it that way because they were never in the same position. They were never in the same predicament, right? There was a dynamic and there was a power relationship there. Some enslaved Africans had to accept or convert as a survival tactic. Some enslaved Africans uh, accepted because they saw similarities in the religious experience or the religious practices, spiritual practices that they had already been familiar with. But I don't want to say never because mama told me never to say never, right? But very rarely was there a situation or very rarely would there be a situation where the enslaved African would accept Christianity on the same exact terms as the Europeans who are presenting it to them. Religious beliefs and rituals of a people are inevitably and inseparably bound up with the material and psychological realities of their daily existence. Enslaved Africans accepted the religion of Christianity on significantly different terms than that of Europeans. Africans did have a concept of God. Europeans didn't introduce the concept of God to Africans. The African worldview says that African people were a highly spiritual people. So the concept of God was not something that Europeans introduced to Africans. Also, Africans, because of the position uh, or the place where they were located in society, they would never display their religion or their faith in the same way that Europeans did because their status or position in America would not allow them to do so. They couldn't accept it on those terms. They couldn't accept the terms um, that Europeans presented to them because they just were not, they weren't there. They, Africans weren't there physically. The contradictions of what Europeans preached versus what they practiced, that should be they, what they practiced was too vast. For example, something that European slave masters, slave oppressors would teach or a part of the theology that they would promote was that you could be spiritually free and physically bound. That if you wait until you die, your reward will come to you in the afterlife. That if you are a good slave now, God will reward you in the afterlife. Now, there's something you got to understand about this. African people who are a spiritual people, to hear something like that, even if they didn't necessarily accept those terms, 
all the way to hear something like that, right? A survival tactic as well, right? This can be something that can be confusing or traumatic to the enslaved African. But this was a contradiction to the spirituality of the African, especially if we look at and if we were to examine many West African spiritual practices. Many West African spiritual practices did not distinguish between a spiritual realm and a physical or earthly realm. Most West African spiritual systems don't look at death the same way Europeans do or that this part of the world does. There's a great deal in this part of the world, the Western Hemisphere, that looks at death as the end, whereas many African spiritual systems, in particular West African, West African spiritual systems, look at death as simply a trance a transformation, a transition period. Not necessarily believing that when one, a loved one, family member crossed over, that, that that did not mean that they were no longer in your life. That did not mean that you would no longer be able to interact with them. It just meant your interaction had to take place differently. Right? So, this notion of being spiritually free, but physically bound, right, was something that just didn't seem correct, something that seemed off. But this was a heavy, this was a big part of the promotion of Christianity during the time of enslavement. This is how Europeans would justify, even amongst themselves, when they were trying to uh, uh, identify or trying to address whether or not Christianity or enslavement was morally correct. They were trying to address whether or not enslavement was morally correct. One of the ways they went about trying, or one of the arguments made to justify enslavement was that the slave could be spiritually free but physically bound because the question becomes well if I'm a Christian and I'm making my enslaved uh, uh, I'm making my slave a Christian then am I sinning by slaving enslaving another Christian this was that question that kept being asked and one of the ways they went to justify continuing with the institution of enslavement, this was one of the ways. You could be spiritually free. We can teach the African how to be spiritually free, even while they are physically bound. This never sat right with many Africans, even if they did not act on it. It is a concept that doesn't sit right, didn't sit right with many Africans. But many enslaved Africans, many free Africans during the period of enslavement in the United States did adopt, accept Christianity. And where the European slave master, where the European slave, uh, uh, enslaved oppressor, uh, where they taught and used Christianity in an attempt to make a more docile, a more passive slave. There were some Africans who used the same religion, the same faith, the same scriptures as a means to try to combat the institution of enslavement. Just real quickly, these should be names, if you were major in black studies, if you took black history, if you took black history one or two, these names should be familiar. Gabriel Prosser, Gabriel Prosser, he identifies with the biblical hero of Samson. Just as Samson was called to destroy the Philistine people, Gabriel believed that he was called to destroy the evil institution of enslavement. One of the things that enslaved Africans picked up on when they read the Bible, they picked up on 
liberation stories. The Bible is a compilation of stories where the nation of Israel is striving to be independent, to be free from oppression, from foreign rule, gain its independence. They're waiting for a Messiah, which means I'm waiting for a Savior, a Redeemer. And in Jewish context, this word Messiah, Savior, Redeemer was not necessarily in spiritual context. They were literally waiting for a Messiah to come back and restore na the nation of Israel. So I'm saying all that to say, in the same Bible where slave masters were pr uh, um, promoting scriptures and texts in an effort to keep the enslaved African docile, enslaved Africans, free Africans, people who are able to read and interpret the Bible for themselves, create their own theology, interpretation of God's message, they are getting different messages from the same Bible where Europeans were projecting another kind of message. So Gabriel, in an effort, saw himself as a Samson, or he saw Samson within himself. He sets forth a plan to seize arms and ammunition from Richmond, Virginia. This is around the year 1800. And part of his plan is to kill all whites that he would encounter and that his followers would encounter. He uses the Bible as a mode of inspiration to end the institution of enslavement. Eventually, the plan is foiled by two enslaved Africans who probably for self-preservation shared the plot with their slave master because understand this, any time there was talk of revolt or, rebe or rebellion, if it was not successful, and more often it was not successful, the, the, the punishment did not just go to the person who tried to initiate the rebellion. All enslaved Africans were punished. All enslaved Africans would be the victims of harsh treatment. So I say all that to say when two enslaved Africans shared the plot with their slave master, right, they are probably contemplating, thinking about what would happen if this does not work out, if this is not successful. Then there's another African who accepts Christianity. His name is Denmark Vesey, who is a Christian. But he sees his Christian, his duty as a Christian is to liberate his fellow people of African descent. In his Bible, in the Bible, he saw similarities in the story of the nation of Israel up against the walls of Jericho. He saw a, similar, a, simulation, a similarity between that story and Africans up against the walls that are created as a result of enslavement. Denmark Vesey is fascinated with the story of Joshua. He's va fascinated with the story of Joshua. He's, he's fascinated with Christianity, but he believes it must be used. It's his Christian duty to liberate his people from enslavement like it was Joshua's duty to bring his people into the promised land. Enslaved Africans, people of African descent, their interpretation, their theology of Christianity and the way they see being a Christian is operating differently than how Europeans see how Europeans should be Christians or even how Africans should be Christians. Denmark Vesey was a member of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the AME Church. Matter of fact, it is very, well, it is much assumed that the church he belonged to had a great deal of involvement with his plot. This is in South Carolina. 
Anybody remember the story of Dylan Ralph? It's pronounced Dylan Roof. I think we pronounce it in English. Where the young man went into a church in South Carolina in a Bible study. Now, I don't know if you guys remember this, but there was reports that he was a white supremacist, right? Why did he pick that church? Was it simply because it's a black church? Well, there is some still being researched, but there is some rhetoric that, again, the, his, the church that he sat in was uh, an AME church. And there is a thought that the AME church that he was in particularly may have been some kind of, con in some way, connected to this African Methodist Episcopal church that was involved in Denmark Vesey's uh, planned revolt or rebellion. Because Dylan Ralph didn't just go to that church on that day. It came out that he's been, he was stalking that church out. He was waiting there. He was, there was a reason why that church was selected. Right? But the African Methodist Episcopal Church, it is said to have helped Denmark Vesey with resources in an attempt to uh, help his, his plot, his plan. A date for June 16th, 1800 to kill all whites except those whites whose position on enslavement was identical to enslaved Africans. So the plan that Denmark Vesey put forth is, hey, our Christian duty is to liberate our enslaved people of African descent, and we will kill all whites except whites whose position on enslavement is identical to enslaved Africans. Plan was foiled. And Vesey was put to death. This is a statue of him. I wish I knew where, but that's a statue in tribute to Denmark Vesey. I believe it's in South Carolina somewhere. Nat Turner. Nat Turner was known as Rev. Nat Turner was a preacher. Nat Turner was, some referred to Nat Turner as a mystic. Nat Turner, his story is that he has, while reading scripture, while studying, while praying, I don't know if you ever saw the movie Birth of a Nation, uh, not the original Birth of a Nation, but the Birth of a Nation that came out a few years ago to try to detail the Nat Turner story. Um, but he was very religious. He was very religious and he was very, um, uh, he was into scripture into studying scripture and trying to figure out what the scriptures mean. He had, he was very much into trying to identify a particular theology for his life in the moment that he was living in. It is said that one of these days, one day while he was studying scripture and while he was praying that he had a vision and in that vision, there was blood on the leaves. I don't know any Kanye West fans in here. I know he had a song where he kept saying blood on the leaves and most people won't know what that is referring to or what that is talking about. Nat Turney had a vision where he saw blood on leaves. He saw blood on the leaves. And then these, this blood on the leaves turned into these symbols. I don't want to say hieroglyphics, but they turned into symbols. But whatever symbols that they turned into in Nat Turner's vision, he interpreted as meaning that he was supposed to create a rebellion and free those who are enslaved from slavery in Virginia. The same Bible that Europeans were using in an effort to make Africans or in an effort that they hoped Africans would become more docile, the same Bible and the same scriptures, Africans began to use other biblical stories and they use it as a means to support their fight for liberation and their desire to be free. Harriet Tubman, also very spiritual, very religious, knew her Bible, studied. Yet, and they called her Black Moses, right? But yet she uses scripture not to become more docile, not to become more passive, but she uses her faith, her Christianity, as a means to, say, to justify why 
she should fight for freedom and for liberation. The story about Harriet Tubman is once you started out with Harriet Tubman, you could not turn around. Anybody heard that story? You cannot turn around. Once you started on the Underground Railroad, don't change your mind. Harriet Tubman said, if you change your mind, I have to kill you. I just got to shoot you. I can't trust that you're going to make it back, and you, you gonna, I can't trust that you won't rat us out. So once you get started, you had to go because the only other option was she would shoot you. All right? But I bring these names up again to highlight the fact that these are either enslaved Africans or they're freed Africans that live in a society where enslavement is still prevalent and they have adhered to the Christian faith, but no way, shape, or form are they interpreting is their theology of Christianity being used in the same way that Europeans were trying to uh, perpetuate it onto enslaved Africans. So let me jump a little bit, because we'll be here all night if I keep going. Let's jump a little around. All right? Christianity and liberation. Let's go, let's jump into the freedom struggle of the 50s and the 60s. The freedom struggle of the 50s and the 60s, you would see there had to be a theological reevaluation of Christianity. Again. And this happens often. What I didn't mention here, in the 1920s, Marcus Garvey, who is probably the best example of, black, of a, of a Pan-Africanist in the 20th century in America, Marcus Garvey, in his effort to create a black nation through his organization, the Universal Negro Improvement Association, he also establishes a church within this organization. He calls it the African Orthodox Church. And Garvey, I believe, himself appoints bishops of this African Orthodox Christian church. He, he was a Christian. And the African Orthodox Christian church makes a definitive statement. This is in America in the 1920s, that God is black. This is what the UNIA says. This is what Marcus Garvey says, that God is black. Now. This is 1920, right? Y'all are quiet when y'all hear that now. But in 1920s, that would have been a very shocking statement. That would have been a statement that if you were black, you probably wouldn't say out loud. You wouldn't say in public. But Marcus Garvey, through his organization, creates an African Orthodox Christian church. And the moniker in it, or the statement that they make is that God is black. So I'm bringing this up to say, what, by the time we get to the 50s and 60s, right, we are in another point where there has to be a theological reevaluation of Christianity because that gap between Marcus Garvey, and, and if you don't know what happens to Marcus Garvey, he's eventually jailed and deported, and it basically puts a, it really slows down uh, his organization, the Universal, Improvement, Universal Negro Improvement Association, African Communities League, UNIA, ACL. And really, after that point, there's really not a critique in, in black America, really, of Christianity. You begin to see almost like uh, 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 you begin to see Christianity and, and um, the church, the black church, being used for just spiritual needs, right? No longer getting involved in political, social, not making any social or political commentary, right? When, when Marcus Garvey said God is black, I mean, it had spiritual ramifications. It had political ramifications. But not since that time has the church really been staying on the path of you know, creating or making political and social commentary. That's until we get to the 50s and the 60s with the civil rights movement. Right. 
In the civil rights movement, we know Dr. Martin Luther King becomes the face and seen as the moral leader of the civil rights movement. Dr. King is very important to black liberation theology, not because he was perpetuating a philosophy of nonviolence. That is not why Dr. King is important to black liberation theology. I even contend that is not why he's important to black America even though the mainstream notion and what we like to what our what mainstream likes to focus on is his nonviolent philosophy but i dare you and i invite you to study the life of martin luther king post 1966 when he goes to chicago to try to see if the methods that he used in the south would be effective in the north and he finds out that he's not successful and he, re he begins to reevaluate all the things that he was doing in the South that gained him some success in the South. He really questioned whether or not it would be successful in the North. So if you, if you study Dr. King 1966 into the end of his life, he's very, he's becoming much more radicalized. Matter of fact, he dies on the Poor People's Campaign, which he believed he thought he was going to be assassinated on the poor people's campaign because of what he was asking America to do, which was to reconsider the way America redistributes her wealth. And the poor people's campaign was going to be a campaign of poor people of all races, colors, and creeds going to Washington, D.C. and staying there, right? So Washington, D.C. could see their nation's poor staying there until... Um, the government has come up with a solution to the question of poverty, right? That was what he was working on at the time that he's assassinated. He goes to Memphis, Tennessee to support sanitation workers who are on strike because he sees this as a beautiful way to continue to promote what he's doing in his poor people's campaign, right? And he's assassinated there in Memphis, Tennessee. But why is Dr. King important to black liberation theology, right? Dr. King becomes the face of the civil rights movement and Doc, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, right? He is a, a preacher, all right? He is a scholar. He gets his PhD in systematic theology from Boston University, right? But he leads a movement or becomes the face of, the move, of a movement in which the black church is highly visible again. He is the pastor, uh, when it starts, uh, Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, when he starts the bus boycott. Uh, eventually, because of the call to lead the civil rights movement, he, re he resigns from there. His father convinces him to become a co-pastor with his father at the Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. So for the rest of his life, he would be a co-pastor with his dad at Ebenezer Baptist Church. But the church becomes a primary force. The civil rights movement is led by church pastors, ministers, and preachers, and congregants. This is a quote that Dr. King says about the church. The church must be reminded that it's not the master or the servant of the state, but rather the conscience of the state. It must be the guide and the critic of the state and never its tool. If the church does not recapture its prophetic zeal, it will become an irrelevant social club with, without moral or spiritual authority. That's Dr. King's critique of the church if it's not engaged in a type of social critique of the society it resides in. What made Dr. King important to black liberation theology and I submit to the black community as a whole is he is able to demonstrate how we can confront the enemy without fear. Yes, the tactic was nonviolent resistance, but more importantly, he gives black people the courage to confront their oppressor or to confront the one perpetuating evil or injustice upon them. Dr. King does this over and over and over again. 
This is why he's important to black liberation theology. Around the same time, there is also another element that's not in the South. I contend, this is my contention about the civil rights movement. Can you imagine if we in our academic settings, in our institutions, even in our schools, with, in our high schools, elementary schools, middle schools, if we taught the civil rights movement from the perspective of the North or from the Midwest or from the West Coast? What we do in our academic settings is we talk about the civil rights movement from the perspective of the South. That's where Dr. King was. That's where Jim Crow was. But most of the United States of America did not have Jim Crow laws. That was in the South. So how do you fight racism that was obviously all over the country, but in a way that there was no Jim Crow laws? I contend that if we were to have or teach the civil rights movement from the perspective of maybe the North, the Midwest, the West Coast, that we may have a more proper understanding of how much or how little progress has been really made in the United States. The North, the West, the Midwest, the way racial discrimination showed itself there was through residential, and which is housing, residential and educational segregation. People were stuck in particular communities. They were stuck in particular residential patterns. Again, schools were segregated. That's the way segregation played out in the North, in the Midwest, in the West Coast, as opposed to they played out this way in the South, but also the South had Jim Crow laws that basically said, you're going to sit here, white people sit there, black people sit here, right? So I'm saying all that to say, here comes another entity that critiques society, but they critique Christianity because there's this notion that Christianity is becoming passive. Dr. King's movement frustrated some folks too. Some folks were frustrated that Dr. King could promote a, the, a, a philosophy where black folks were struck and hit and their response was not to retaliate. Of course, one of the most fiercest critiques of that philosophy was the Nation of Islam, right? which was led by Elijah Muhammad. Malcolm X was the spokesperson, so he got a lot of the TV time. One of the quotes Malcolm X says is, I believe, a re I believe in a religion that, I believe in a religion that believes in freedom. Anytime I have to accept a religion that won't let me fight a battle for my people, I say to hell with that religion. So again, we're seeing there's a particular theology Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam give a scathing cultural criticism of Christianity. Malcolm X rises to prominence as the national spokesman for the NOI, but he is the mouthpiece for the Nation of Islam, and he's the one that's getting the TV time saying the things that he's saying. So he would become the face of the scathing critique of Dr. King's nonviolent philosophy. There's a preacher in Detroit who is a Christian, but again, because he does not live in the South, he does not agree with the philosophy of Dr. King. The North, Detroit, the Midwest, racism functioned and operated a little bit differently. He comes up with this philosophy or this theology called black Christian nationalism. It was his belief that the church had to be more involved in the fight for power in position in society, not just integration. He would go on to leave his church and he would found another church that he called Shrines of the Black Madonna. He debuts this church in Detroit, 1967, I believe. You can't see it. I mean, you can see it, but it was a 67 foot. No, I could be lying. Maybe not that big. It was a, a, a maybe 30 foot something sculpture of a black Madonna holding a black baby Jesus. And that would be placed in the back of this new church he was starting. So he would start this church, and they were called the Shrines of the Black Madonna. And then later on, he would create an entirely new denomination. Remember I talked about Marcus Garvey's African Orthodox Church? He would take from that, and he would call it the Pan-African Orthodox Christian Church which 
still operates and functions today, and it was part of my dissertation that I, I studied. And then, so I'm sorry. These are philosophies. Black Christian nationalism would eventually give birth to black liberation theology. Black liberation theology. James Cone. Somebody's coming. James Cone. Welcome, welcome. How you doing? James Cone would be the scholar that would introduce this theology to the academic to the academic world. Now, he would introduce it to academia, so oftentimes he's credited with black, he's credited with black liberation theology, but again, I want to Remind you that these theologies, these, these thought processes, these are things that existed within the black community all throughout. But he introduces this concept, black liberation theology, into the academic world because he is a seminary student. He's a minister. He's a seminary student. And during the black power era, he, he feels very conflicted. He's frustrated with what's happening with black people during the black power era. But look, he's a Christian, so he's trying to identify with Dr. King and what he's doing. But deep down, he, has, he believes Malcolm X has some validity to the cultural critiques that Malcolm X is saying about Christianity. So there's something within James Cone that's just not sitting right with the fact that he's a Christian but yet there is this interpretation out there that if I'm a Christian, I can't be actively engaged in the liberation of my people in a more active participatory way. And the only way I can do it is if I follow Dr. King's nonviolent philosophy. This didn't sit right with James Cone, right? He would write a couple books. He would write a book. 1969, I believe, maybe, yeah, 1969, the first book he would write, it's called Black Theology and Black Power, All right? The burning theological question was, how can I reconcile Christianity and black power? Because again, the dominant notion was that you could not be both. How can I reconcile Christianity and black power? Martin Luther King Jr.'s idea of nonviolence and Malcolm X's by any means necessary philosophy. That's out of his book, Black Power and Black Theology. Black liberation theology is seeking to answer this question. What does it mean to be Christian and black, particularly in America? I'm almost finished here, y'all. One year later, because when he writes this book, it's not necessarily an academic book. It's not an academic work. This is him trying to work out those conflicts within himself. But one year later, he does write a book that he believes could help, and it, it's more academic in its writing. It's called A Black Theology of Liberation. A Black Theology of Liberation. He writes it one year later. In the book, it says a Christian theology is a theology of liberation. It is a rational study of the being of God in the world in light of the existential situation of an oppressed community, relating the forces of liberation to the essence of the gospel, which is Jesus Christ. This means that it's, sole, it's the sole reason for the existence for existence is to put into ordered speech the meaning of God's activity in the world so that the community of the oppressed will recognize that its inner thrust of liberation is not only consistent with the gospel, but is the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, what James Cone is saying is what makes a Christian a Christian is the role that they play in liberating activities. That's what James Cone is articulating in his book, A Black Theology of Liberation, that you cannot be a Christian if you sit idly by and side with 
oppression or if you sit idly by and do not actively engage in combating oppression. The two are basically the same from a spiritual point of view. If you decide to side with oppression, you cannot be a Christian. Or if you decide to not engage, not to actively engage in combating oppression, you are not a Christian. So as we come to a close, don't clap, don't clap. As we come to a close, the question, how can you tell what? So for me personally, I am in the ministry and I'm at the age of 21. I left Christianity and organized religion because I also felt that I could not be a Christian because of the way it was. I was learning it and the way it was being taught to me that I could not be a Christian and be actively engaged in fighting for liberation of people of African descent. So I, I thought I had to pick. So I didn't pick Jesus. <laughs> I didn't pick religion. I didn't pick Christianity. I picked to be on the side of whatever I can do to help my people from being oppressed and exploited. I was a director of an African-centered school in Philadelphia called Lotus Academy. It was an African-centered school. And I never forget, I heard two parents talking about church. And it just blew my mind because I, the assumption I had about the parent was that, oh, they could not possibly go to church. I mean, these were people who changed their names to African names. They wore African garb and African clothes. But they were talking about what they did at church. So being the nosy person that I am, I went up to her and I said, did you say you went to church? So I just really asked her, how do you reconcile the two? How do you proclaim Christianity and be about your people's freedom and liberation? So she actually gave me this book to read. And when she gave me this book to read, that's when I knew this is Albert Kleegs, the one I told you about the, uh, the painting of the Black Madonna, Shrines of the Black Madonna. This is the book he wrote called Black Christian Nationalism. And when she gave me this book, it was like a, a, a light went off, and I knew that this is what I wanted to research. I knew this is what I wanted to research because it had a personal, I had a personal connection to it. A year before he wrote this book, he wrote this book called The Black Messiah. It's a collection of his speeches. So I began to study, and what I began to come upon was James Cone and a theology of, a black theology of liberation. And that inspired me. I found some more stuff as I'm doing my research, which eventually led me to writing my first book on liberation theology, black liberation theology. So how can you tell if, so, if it's black liberation theology? Black liberation theology is rooted in, again, theology, human interpretation of God's message. Black liberation theology is rooted in the black experience. Black liberation theology has to be relevant to black lives. Black liberation theology, how does it show itself inside and outside of the church walls? Black liberation theology can never be just make sure you go to church on Sunday and you'll be all right. It can't be just make sure you say your prayers at night and everything will be fine. There has to be another component to it. And then lastly, does it pick a side? Black liberation theology makes the claim that God is not neutral. God is never neutral. God is never looking down and saying, hey, I'm going to just see how it all plays out. That God is always on the side of those who are oppressed, exploited, and um, oppressed, exploited, and taken advantage of. God is on the side of the oppressed. And when you find yourself in that power dynamic, the oppressed versus the oppressor, God's work is being on the side of the oppressed and doing whatever necessary to alleviate that oppression. Black liberation theology 
has also helped usher in a new kind of theology, womenist theology, womenist theology, black women who have come forward and said, look, we also got another problem with, the, with, with, with this thing called Christianity. We have a problem with how male-centered it is. We have a problem with how male-dominant it is. Women, womenist theology demands that, it's demanding that Christianity and its rhetoric more intentionally center women and their experiences as well. It demands that men, like myself, men in the church, patriarchal notions of Christianity, we have to acknowledge that hurt, acknowledge the hurt and damage done to all when patriarchy is the norm in language, thought, and action. Renita Weems, Katie Cannon, Katie Douglas, these are some leaders in the womanist theology movement. Katie Cannon, she passed away, I want to say, last year. I think it was 2021. may have been 2020. Y'all don't watch Good Times. Anybody grew up on Good Times? No, just me? Good Times? There was an episode in Good Times where Mike, the youngest son, I think he got JJ, or maybe I think JJ painted a black Jesus. And it was so controversial that the parents was like, we don't want you to hang that up in this house. They were offended by it. That's how deeply rooted was the notion that Jesus was white, that Christianity was white. It was so deeply rooted that J.J.'s parents, James and Florida Evans, right, they were offended by this picture, and the episode is them arguing over whether or not to hang it up in their house. Of course, Mike, who was the little black revolutionary, right? He loves it, but his parents are a little nervous. 1969, this picture was on the cover of Ebony magazine. And Ebony almost went out of business because people were going to boycott it. Who do you think is going to boycott it? Who? It was black folks. Because white folks weren't buying Ebony like that. But that's how deeply rooted this idea that Jesus was white, that even the thought that Jesus may be black was offensive to black folks. This is part of the story. This is part of what black liberation theology was seeking to eradicate, this thought process. Adam Klieg, Reverend Albert Klieg, <clears throat> says in his book, The Black Messiah, for nearly 500 years, the illusion that Jesus was white dominated the world only because white Europeans dominated the world. Now with emergence of, of the nationalist movements of the world's colored majority, the historic truth is finally beginning to emerge that Jesus was a non-white leader of a non-white people struggling for national liberation against the rule of a white nation, Rome. The intermingling of races in African and the Mediterranean area is an established fact. The nation Israel was a mixture of Chaldeans, Egyptians, Midianites, Ethiopians, Cushites, Babylonians, and other dark peoples, all of whom were already mixed with the black people of Central Africa. So that's the statement that Adam Klieg makes, Reverend Albert Klieg, I'm sorry, makes in his book, The Black Messiah. And I'm concluding with two video clips explaining black liberation theology in case you don't, in case all of what I said still I didn't do a good job, all right? Uh, one clip is of Reverend Jeremiah Wright. Are you all familiar with Reverend Jeremiah Wright? He probably got more national fame when one of his most famous congregants, former President Barack Obama, Right, was running for office, and they took a clip of one of his messages, and it became a soundbite. But Reverend Dr. Jeremiah Wright is a practitioner, and those who adhere to black liberation theology, we, we look up to Reverend Jeremiah Wright, not for that speech, but for the vast work that he has done. So I just want to play that clip. I hope this works. There's lots of controversy about black liberation theology. As I understand it, black liberation theology reads the Bible 
through the experience of people who have suffered and who then are able to say to themselves that we read the Bible differently because we have struggled than those do who have not struggled. Is that is that a fair uh, bumper sticker of, of liberation? I think, theology? I think that's a fair bumper sticker. I think that the term liberation theology or black liberation theology could cause more problems and red flags for people who don't understand it. But when I hear the word black liberation theology being the, the interpretation of scripture from the oppressive people, that's the Jewish story. <laughs> exactly. From Genesis to Revelation. These are people who wrote the word of God that we honor and love under Egyptian oppression, Assyrian oppression, Babylonian oppression, Persian oppression, Greek oppression, Roman oppression. So that their understanding of what God is saying is very different from the Greeks, the Romans, the Egyptians. And and that's what that's what prophetic theology of the African American yeah, Talk a little bit about that. The prophets loved Israel, but they hated the waywardness of Israel. And they were calling Israel out of love, Dr. Justice, exactly. not damning exactly. Israel, right? Right. They were saying that God was in fact if you look at them damning, condemning, if you look at Deuteronomy. Uh, it talks about blessings and curses, how God doesn't bless everything. God does not bless gangbangers. God does not bless dope dealers. God does not bless young thugs that hit old women upside the head and snatch their purse. But God does not bless that. God does not bless the killing of babies. God does not bless the killing of enemies. And when you look at blessings and cursings, like out of the Hebrew tradition from the book of Deuteronomy, that's what the prophets were saying, that God is not blessing this. God does not bless it. Bless us. And when we're calling them, the prophets call them to repentance and to come back to God. If my people who are called by my name, God says to Solomon, will humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. God says that, wicked ways. Now during my reign, then will I hear from heaven. One of the most controversial sermons that you preach is a sermon you preach that ended up being that sound about it by goddamn America. Where governments lie, God does not lie. Where governments change, God does not change. And I'm through now. But let me leave you with one more thing. Governments fail. The government in this text comprised of Caesar, Quirinius, Pontius Pilate, Pontius Pilate. The Roman government failed. The British government used to rule from east to west. The British government had a union jack. She colonized Kenya, Ghana, Nigeria, Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad, and Hong Kong. Her navies ruled the seven seas all the way down to the tip of Argentina in the Falklands. But the British government failed. The Russian government failed. The Japanese government failed. The German government failed. And the United States of America's government, when it came to treating her citizens of Indian descent fairly, she failed. She put them on the reservations. When it came to treating her citizens of Japanese descent fairly, she failed. She put them in internment prison camps. When it came so I won't play it all, but again, he's making the point that the perspective that you are reading and the, where, the position from where you're from when you're reading scripture or when you're reading or listening to God's message will impact your interpretation. Last one, and it's not this long, it's just two minutes. Last quote. Last video. This was, PBS put out a, uh, a documentary called The Black Church. I think they did it, I think it was two, two Februarys ago, it was during Black History Month, I want to say of 2020. There was a clip that, again, talks about black liberation theology in the entire experience of the black church. It was about a three or four minute clip. Soon a voice from the academy would create a new theology that fused the cultural, the political, and the spiritual, radically redefining the role of black Christianity in a revolutionary new era. Right theology, basically, is a theology which has defined the Christian faith in such a way that it has no relationship to black people. In 1969, James Cohn, a professor at Union Theological Seminary, published Black Theology and Black Power. 
making its way into seminaries. But James Cone, who's trying to figure out how to translate King's moral call to the nation and express it in a way that will speak to the rage of the moment. Black theology is basically a new way of looking at the relationship between black religion and black political struggle and an embrace of the tenets of black is beautiful in a comfort with African inflected practices. God is on the side of the oppressed. And since the oppressed are the ones who need to be liberated, he must be identified with that condition. Cohen argued that God was so intimately connected with struggle and against oppression that God, in effect, had been black all along. He said that God's story is the black story and the black story is God's story. Mm -hmm. And that, he said, is the Christian story. <laughs> I said, Lord Jesus. <laughs> I was ready to leave Christianity because if I couldn't be black and Christian, then I wasn't going to give up being black. What I discovered when I discovered Dr. Cohn's work was my own black faith. Cohn's theology would soon move from the confines of the seminary into popular culture. What is it? I call it black Jesus. Black Jesus. Now this is what the brothers need. All right. So, again, I just want to uh, reiterate black liberation theology is an interpretation of God's message that speaks specifically to how black folks in America or throughout the world could use, uh, could liberate or free themselves from oppression, injustice, uh, and all that other stuff that, that, that we deal with on a regular basis. And black liberation theology asks the question, what does it mean to be black and Christian? Black liberation theology makes the, takes the position that God is not neutral, that in order for you to be Christian, it's not enough to just go to church, it's not enough to just say your prayers, it's not enough to just ask for forgiveness, but you must be engaged in a liberation struggle. You must be engaged in activity that alleviates oppression, whether it be from you or from any other people. So I thank you all for paying attention to this quick, was it quick? No? Okay, but I thank you for paying attention and I hope uh, I was able to uh, share uh, and enlighten you on some things that maybe you didn't know before. Thank you so much for your time. We do have, we do have five minutes. Um, if there's any questions, comments, or just testimonials, y'all wanna share a story, then that's all good, we could do that too. But we do have five minutes left, and I wanna use that time. Yes, sir. Misogynist, you know, misogynistic, you know, behaviors of the church, you know, mm -hmm. especially as a black man who, you know, as a black minister who also has to, you know, think about, I guess, black women in particular. Yeah. Well, for me, again, if I, I always come from this fundamental thought that you have to pick a side. That, that the first thing about black liberation theology is you have to be courageous enough to pick a side. The easiest thing to do is to straddle the fence, right? So black liberation theology says you have to pick a side. Wherever there's a group that is oppressed, you have to talk about their oppression and how do they alleviate themselves from their oppression. So one of the things, if you're talking about patriarchy and misogyny, right, one of the things that I do, for example, just this past Sunday, I preached a sermon on Esther. I don't know how many times people hear sermons about Esther. I preached a sermon before about Queen Vashti, who lost her queen. She lost her crown because she did not want to dance and exploit herself in front of the king. Uh, you address issues such as um, sexual violence, rape, misogyny. You talk about that. You put women in positions of leadership. All my associate ministers are women. Not that I'm exclusively looking for women, but the brothers just not coming to church like they used to either. But my point is, in, our, in the leadership of the church where I pastor and been blessed to pastor, women are in leadership positions. Uh, it is my prayer that within the next um, 
year or so, we will have our first woman deacon. But these are some things, especially in the black church, where there's some strongholds as far as there's still churches who believe women shouldn't be in places of leadership, that women shouldn't be in ministry. And uh, for me specifically as a black liberation practitioner, um, disrupting those things give me joy. So disrupting those things and um, I kind of, I, I look at it like God's work. I look at it like Jesus disrupted a lot of things. And I know we like to, um, well, not we, but a lot of people like to reduce Jesus Christ to a spiritual entity. But, you know, Jesus Christ was crucified because he was a political threat, not a spiritual threat. So that's to say that he was engaging in some work. He was doing some things that were going to, uh, that were empowering people who were oppressed. And he was seen as a threat. So he was causing disruptions. You know, I think John Lewis called it good trouble, but stuff like that, things like that inspire me. And I think that black liberation theology has prepared me to look at certain disruptions like that as good trouble and look at them as being in line with some of the work that Christ was doing or would be doing. Yeah. And you, yes. Well, what are some more of Malcolm X's cultural critiques of the church and did it change towards the end of his life like some of his other beliefs did? I don't think it, he never adhered to Christianity. Again, Malcolm X, I don't know if a lot of people know, but his father was a Baptist preacher. His father was also a nationalist. A lot of people think the first time Malcolm X was exposed to nationalism was under Elijah Muhammad, but Malcolm X's mother and father were Garveyites. They were part of the UNIA that I was telling you about when Garvey created the church. But the church had stopped making those types of moves. His frustration came with the church. His frustration was that the black church was probably the biggest, most organized black institution in America, but yet it wasn't being used in a way to gain political freedom and power to black people. So a lot of his critique comes out of a sense of frustration. It's also used as a means to draw black folks into the nation of Islam to say, look, there's another alternative other than the church. But what attracts Malcolm X to many young black preachers like James Cone who feel like they should be in some level of solidarity with Dr. King, but the younger generation during the black power movement, their rhetoric is more in line with Malcolm X who dies in 65 but when his autobiography comes out, there's a reassessment among many in the black community of what Malcolm X was saying. So James Cone tries to reconcile that. I said before what made Dr. King important is he showed us how to confront the enemy without being fearful. What made Malcolm X important was that Malcolm X showed black folks how to articulate their needs and their desires without worrying about how white people felt about it. So there was a legitimacy there of Malcolm X who was like, people like, yo, I would say what he would say, but we used to just say that in the kitchen table, around the kitchen table when the, when the door is closed or when the lights are off. We don't, we don't go outside and say this stuff. But some of his cultural critique was that Christianity, especially the way Dr. King was promoting it through his nonviolent philosophy, was making black folks accept their plight and be too passive. So the Nation of Islam... Even though, when you look at it, they never got involved in any physical altercation. They never did anything like that. But he would present the Nation of Islam as an alternative to civil rights movement. When in actuality, most people don't know this, the Nation of Islam at that time was much more conservative as far as their argument was we don't even participate in the civil rights movement. That their belief was we should be completely separated so we're not getting involved in any movement that is talking about integration. And Malcolm X would be frustrated because he would, there was a part of him that wanted to get involved in the movement in some way, shape, or form. But Elijah Muhammad took a conservative approach in the sense that Nation of Islam, they don't get involved in the movement at all. So it's 8.31, but there's one, go, there's one more. We're not going to leave you I hanging. One, uh, thing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering about, like, I know we talked about, I guess, like, Reconciling with Malcolm and Martin a lot, um, but uh, one thing that comes to mind is uh, how 
Sophie Carmichael or Carmen Terry talk about it. Mm -hmm. And he, when he talks about his involvement in the movement, he's like, yeah, like, I'm not violent, but, like, as a tactic, if it works, yes. right? If it gets me my goal, he's mm -hmm. like, I'm not violent, but, and I think some cases, like, yeah, but I have a gun in my back pocket, like, mm -hmm. but, um, how does, uh, how does that, I guess, do, does that make sense with theology? Can you, yeah. or is nonviolence a way of life? So, good question. Here's the thought process. So, again, the process is nonviolent as a tactic. You would find that a lot of people agreed with it, but they believed if the tactic showed that it did not work, you had to try to find another tactic, which was the argument of people like Kwame Ture, John Henry Clark, uh, even many folks in, in, in the black power movement. They're okay with nonviolence as a strategy or a temporary tactic, but as soon as it's revealed that that tactic is not using and not working, we got to come up with another tactic. Dr. King was a little different in the sense that he looked at it as a way of life. So there was no other alternative, right? Um, the second part of your question, you asked if there's room for... I guess like as a, as something, as a religion that you would promote. So, well, I guess it's maybe a personal question, but... No, this is good. During the Black Power Movement, again, leaders of, politi leaders of mainstream politicians were asking churches to please condemn the rebellions and the riots in the inner cities with the hope that that would encourage the young active black participants to stop rebellion and riots in their cities. There was a group called the Negro Churchmen, Count, the Church of Negro Councilmen, or the Church of the ne Men of the Negro Churchmen Council, something like that, I'm, I'm messing up the name. But they wrote a statement where they said, we are not going to condemn these activists. We're going to look at their, we got to get to the root of the problem. The problem is not the fact that they are rebelling or rioting in these communities. That's a symptom of a, a much deeper problem. And until we seek to address that problem, we're not going to condemn the actions of these uh, black youth. And they make the, uh, James Cone goes even further to say, the actions of the black youth is the most Christian thing happening in the United States of America because he's saying it's the most liberating act that's being conducted. So again, there's a, there's a, a difference of interpretation, but black liberation theology prioritizes alleviating oppression. And really, the tactics, and I, I guess there's some value assigned to which tactic you want to use, but ultimately, if you're about liberating and it's not about any selfish thing or any greed, if it's about alleviating oppression, then the idea is to look at that in a way where that is the goal. So that should impact how you view the particular tactic. Thank you all very much. I appreciate y'all being here. Next week, we have two more. We have two more uh, lectures next week. Professor Anthony Dandridge will be giving his lecture. And then the following week, uh, our Dr. Cruz Bueno will be here to give her lecture. I want to encourage you all to please come out and see the research that they're working on. Uh, I know there were some students who asked, what can you do with black studies, with a degree in black studies? So hopefully, uh, we're examples of what you can do with this degree. Thank you so much for your time, everybody. Get home safely. God bless you, and good night. <laughs>